Hello and welcome to Listening with the Youth Council podcast, episode three, with the, with the Herbstreit Effort Youth Council. I'd like to welcome our special guest, Hannah Marshall, Lee Gow from the National FA Youth Council and David Harding. What does mental health mean to you? For me, it's all about emotional well-being and looking after yourself because you always look after yourself like outside your body so you should really take care of yourself inside as well. Mental health, it can affect people's obviously health and how they feel uh, dis- other disabilities can cause mental health illnesses um when you get ill like dementia cancer they all types of men- mental health i think it means like it's your well-being and how it can um, affect your motivation or how much you want to do stuff so you know from people going out all the time playing football to not being able to then you know when we go back to that, are people still going to have the motivation to want to go back? I've experienced it in my own sort of way. I, I, I battled, battled with a lot of demons in my life, and like, which has made me feel like I'm a different person. But I always think of like the saying of two negatives can lead to three positives in my life. Like the two negatives, are, the positives I've had in my life is coming to the HWA Youth Council, expand my network, where I meet all, all awesome people. How I like to define it and how I recognise it in myself is um, how able I am to just deal with everyday stresses of life. Um, I personally notice that if my mental health is perhaps neglected, um, an everyday stress, which normally I'd be able to cope with, I struggle with. Um, and for me, that's a big telltale sign of when I need to take some time and really look after m- my brain as well as my body. At times, there's a lot that I perhaps do that I think is good for my mental well-being and my brain um, have kept active. Um, but I'm definitely a very big extrovert and mm-hmm. I just vibe off of um, human interaction and being able to feel the passion people have, particularly working in sport, not being able to have that. It, yeah, it can be really difficult at time. Your mental health is equally important to your physical health. Um, it's about balance. It's about your place in the world, your sense of self-worth. Um, so it's fundamental to who you are. So, David, just off the back of that, um Do you think that especially children and young people's mental health has deteriorated during the the coronavirus pandemic? Children and young people and and society at large um, have been affected in all sorts of ways, emotionally and otherwise, uh, during the last year. Um, I think it's important that we understand that for children and young people, having a a whole year of um, a relatively short life is, is a is a bigger percentage than for someone old and crusty like me. And the disruption to routines, um, being able to see, go to school, being able to see your peers, to be able to play football, all of those things have, have been taken away. It's going to take some time before we actually get a, a really comprehensive picture. So I've joined the HFA Youth Council. I've expanded my like olive branches. I met Hannah Marshall, met Lee met David, met the fabulous Scott Russell. But yeah, I think it's just all like joining the HFA Youth Council has helped me expand, become a better person. I think for me, being being the chair of two incredible youth panels has allowed me to develop as a person, but it's also really, really helped my, my mental health in terms of I've been working from home for the past um, year or so, since the 13th of March, 2020. And um, my mental health was really um, has declined a tiny bit because I haven't been going out um, because of my disabilities. It's allowed me to um, see people from a, from around the country because I do like to travel. I do love the theatre and going to support my beloved Aston Villa, um, but I haven't been able to do any of that, and that's really really um, impacted my mental health. And it's interesting, isn't it, that there's a um there's a theme coming out from those those comments and and it's about connection and that's been the biggest hurdle 
Yeah. Um, I know some of the work that, that we do at Herefordshire Mind, um, particularly around crisis support, is we're seeing increasing numbers of people that that, that want and are desperate to, to actually be in the same physical space as another another person. I think you mentioned, Lee, um, we are designed to be social creatures. We thrive when we're together uh, in whatever context. And, and that is that's really fundamental to who any of us are. Billy, you picked up on this. Are people going to be motivated to want to, to get back to training and, and, and back to practice? And there's almost an, an, uh, an anticipation that, or an anxiety that actually, do I feel comfortable about going back to do that? People are going to be, or some people are going to be anxious. Not everybody by any means. Lots of people are just chomping at the bit, can't wait to get back to, to it, which is fantastic. And that's a great motivator. But just recognise that for some, that journey might be slightly hard. What can cause people to have poor mental health? It's complicated, I think, is the, is the first thing to say. There isn't a single cause. Um, I think it is a mixture. I mean, just to pick up on what Louis was saying, um, having other underlying um, issues, physical health issues can impact, not surprisingly, on, on your mood and, and your emotional health. There's an awful lot of um, research and science that, that, that talks about how our brain functions. And sometimes, you know, we take it for granted that this, this lump of grey matter that sits in our skull, merrily <laughs> carrying on doing its thing, um, is really, really complicated. There's also the external factors as well. So, yeah. you know, we've been talking about the, the, the impact of the pandemic, but there can be a multitude of other factors. You've lost your job, a relationship breakdown, a bereavement. All of these things can have an impact on, on how you feel. What might have a negative impact for me or, or leave me with an inability to, to be able to cope or that sense of coping um, will be different to anybody else. As David said, like I completely agree. I don't think there's one cause for mental health and completely what he said about different people react differently as well. Like I may be able to cope with a lot more stress or I may be able to cope with a lot less stress than the average person. Um, and that obviously affects your mental health. Um, so I definitely wouldn't say there's there's one cause and that's what makes it such a complex issue and the fact that there's not a magic pill that can solve poor mental health because that isn't how it works. Um, and then in respect to what are we doing as National Youth Council, we're engaging with our young people. Um, a lot of people have said that we've done more this season than we've ever done before um, and a lot of that is we probably have had a little bit more free time um, but I haven't felt any less busy this past year because we've invested all of the free time we've had into our young people like we've brought out um, Black Lives Matters webinar this year to educate um, and empower our, our young people make sure they've got activism projects to then work on we've also run our regional youth network so this is the first year we've run it and I was so pleased to hear Cam that you found that that had been um, a really great opportunity for you to connect with other youth leaders, like talking about mental health and just having different webinars. It could be a completely unrelated. It's, it's inspired me and kept me going. We are there. We haven't stopped. In a time where the world stopped, National Youth Council hasn't stopped working for its youth leaders. I can definitely see that the Youth Council at national level hasn't stopped and it's been brilliant to see. I believe it could be a range of things. I think it depends on who you are as a person. Like Some people will find joys in being able to go out with their friends and then mm. obviously some people have to stay at home. Um, and I think it's, it's a whole mix of things and it's um, how you deal with it, whether it's you can deal with it yourself or whether you reach out to people and then if you can't reach out to those people um getting yourself stuck in that hole i think there's a lot of pressure on young people you go from gcse's to btex and a levels and trying to get into uni you've got that all to balance and then you've also got like social media which i think is a big issue within young people and when it comes to mental health because everyone just shows off their best lives like for me when it comes to instagram 
I tend to only post when I'm on holiday. <laughs> From an outside perspective, if you looked at my feed, you'd be like, whoa, constantly traveling the world. When really, it's just sometimes I don't feel comfortable to post my everyday life because that's what everyone else isn't doing that. It's just yeah. constant, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. And I think like if from an outsider's perspective, if you didn't know this, there's a lot of pressure to like be living your best life. And like that's exactly. said all the time, live your best life. Hannah, you and Lee will both know that I've had so many incredible opportunities through the National FA Youth Council this year that without all of those things, I wouldn't be as mentally sane as what I am. <laughs> Does social media play a part in poor mental health? It's a really important point that you've raised and, and picked up uh, the impact of of social media, the expectations that surround it. Um, that phrase, Hannah, that you used about living your best life. Well, you know, reality is that we don't constantly live our best life every day. That's no. that's real life. So I think it is important that whenever we talk about, well, health in general, but, you know, the conversation today is about mental health. It's all about balance and being able to recognise when things aren't in balance. And also sometimes recognising if a if your, your best buddy says, uh, is everything OK? <laughs> You're posting quite some weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, what's going on? So, Louis, do you think that social media can be negative when it comes to young people's mental health? Um, definitely, because there's people out there, like the guys have already said, posting all about themselves. Yeah. So, much. obviously, in the younger generation, it's based on, like, for example, Instagram. Who has more followers yeah. it means you're more popular. And I, I think a lot of um, a lot of bad mental health will stem from social media because someone will look at someone and go, oh, I wish I could be them. And it brings them down. Whereas ultimately, you've got to be yourself. But doing things like this has got our numbers up, has got us visible, which has been key. And I think that um, social media, if it's used correctly, can be awesome. But if it isn't, it can be very, very toxic, toxic and it can go that way very, very quickly. I always post about... My FA journey, or if I'm traveling the world with Cam, go see <laughs> the mighty villa. But what I find is you, you can see like a lot of people have happiness. So like if we post that happiness or something, you can always guarantee you get that one person who will go out of spite to post negativity. And it mm. one, that one negativity can affect someone's day. And I also um, think that especially um, mental health is something that we as a youth council want to look at more we need to talk about it because you may or may not know this but four of our youth council all have disabilities which is something that i'm proud of because we are diverse in that sense however it can be negative in a way because it it can be difficult to obviously progress things. No, I'm not making excuses. I'm just trying to make people understand that we are trying to be realistic as a youth council by saying we are completely different to your Manchesters, your Londons, your Durhams, because we have we're smaller and we have a different group of people wanting to be on our youth council. So we do things completely different to the big youth council. What would you do if someone reached out to you in confidence, admitting they were suffering with poor mental health? From a personal pers perspective, I'd like reassure the person and like make sure they're all right. And like, I'd, I'd obviously like make sure my friend was okay. And I'd, I'd presume that's the person that would be coming to me when it comes to this issue. But um, from a youth council perspective, it's probably the same, except for the fact I'd have to report it. Like going to like the safeguard and lead is like the thing to do when in that situation. Like you should never promise that you're not going to tell anyone because you don't know what negative impact that's going to have. But there's also like the um, organisations such as Minds that you can like guide people to. Like if you don't feel comfortable talking about it, there's always people to talk to. And I think if someone's come to you in confidence to talk about that, like, you can say, 
I don't feel comfortable, but he is someone that will. Is mental health talked about enough with young people in schools and colleges? No, I know that for a fact, that they definitely don't talk about it and they don't help the other guys at college with mental health issues. Do you think that they should? Definitely, because that is important to their lives. I don't think it's spoke about enough. Um, like maybe even if instead of doing it as like a whole class thing, obviously break it into groups, but tell like have someone at a school and make them like the children aware they can go to them about it. Yeah. Because I think a lot of schools that they, they have counsellors or some schools will and some schools won't, but no one really tends to go to them. What are the National Youth Council currently doing in regards to mental health? I think there's definitely room for us to do more things regarding mental health. Um, but for now, it has been a focus. And again, when it comes to lockdown, we have been trying to get everyone involved. So I think it's not really talking about mental health as such, because we know there's different organisations that are already doing that. Doing things that show like positive effects in mental health. I'm conscious that it's not obvi obviously a priority for the National FA Youth Council. I was just interested to understand whether that had been a discussion that you've had. Um, I wouldn't say that it's not a priority of ours. It definitely is. And it's something that underpins everything that we do. So rather than us saying, let's run a webinar on mental health, mm -hmm. it, it comes into every single thing that we do. And like why we exist is to care and to develop our young people. I know we've said about the negative effects of the pandemic. Um, and yeah, at times it's negatively affected my mental health, but also in the last 12 months, it's the most I've ever spoken about my mental health and the most I've ever had it around. Um, in like National Youth Council meetings within our team, we always ask each other how we are. Um, something we commonly use is let us know a colour that describes how your day's been or how you're feeling. We all speak about honestly within our team how we're feeling when we're struggling as well. And I've never been in a team where I've felt comfortable to, to share and be vulnerable. And yeah, that's a really comfortable environment that the National Youth Council have created this season. What I found is I've been also able to speak more about my mental health. I've been able to open up to people. And also, I, like if I have spare five minutes, I always check on people. I always find if they don't want to talk about it, I say my phone's always on. Big for myself and Cam, since we've been on the the hair of the FAU council we always can rely on like scott if we're if we're like gonna explode scott's always been there like a, like a fun uncle sort of figure and, ha and helps out quite a lot and uh, yeah i think it's all about that as long as you've got that connection that circle of friends you can always guarantee you're gonna get happiness <laughs> What can schools and colleges do to help their students who might be suffering with mental health problems? Pretty much what we could do is we could give out like flyers to everybody so they could like have a little bit of information about what they could do to help. Do you think we as the County FA Youth Council, do you think that we could do something around encouraging young people who play football when we're allowed to get back to it from next week. But that would get um, other young people involved in the HFA Youth Council and knowing about us to do with mental health. School staff are already stretched. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, there are very strict protocols in place around supporting young people's mental health. It's been referred to earlier, you know, issues around safeguarding, for example. But I think um, Particularly with schools, I think um, we need to broaden the approach. Uh, one of the phrases that that's um, used increasingly now is uh, a whole school approach. So it's not just about um, the young people themselves, but it's about the teaching staff. Um, it's about the board of governors. But equally important is um, providing support and guidance to parents and carers so that it becomes a virtuous circle so that everybody can talk about it, feel confident to talk about it and know what to do or where to go. Even if it's something as simple as um, informing students where they can go and get help, because I know of some people that 
look for help they don't know where to go they don't know whether to go to their friends or a teacher or go elsewhere so maybe just providing information on where to go it's about having like a unified approach as well um it shouldn't be down to every school and college individually um and also there's a lot of work out there that charities such as such as mind have already done um so mind supported dfa in producing their mental health guidance notes and this pack i think 20 it may have been 2019 it came out don't quote me on that i'm not sure um but that pack's really useful and it's about guidance when um i think it's for a coach for coaches and managers but it can apply in all all aspects of life maybe it just needs to be shared more widely because at, as a ngb um it is valued and it is like it is really important that people speak about mental health i totally agree with lee's point about how it shouldn't really be all on the schools individually like we really should be looking at the government and saying like this is what needs to be taught like the curriculum should change mm. like even just an hour a week doing like psha which I know we did in like year seven and eight, but after that it was dropped. Mm. So I think it just needs to look for, need to look at what needs to be prioritised within the curriculum. Um, what I like, and I keep going from personal experience, but helps me with my answers. Um, what I f found is also is like in year eleven at school, I suffered with mental health badly because I lost one of my parents in year eleven. And um, what I found is I was found in like outside the world school family i always go to somebody who's got like a nice warming you know like a warm humor sort of thing yeah like, like you could tell a kind because you could you could if you put two people in a room somebody's warm kind we've got another person who's like mistrudgeable like matilda angry and all that <laughs> lot who are you gonna go to you go to the person who's warm and kind. And I just quickly want to ask you a supplementary question, Dan. There is no pressure for you to answer this, but I'm just interested to know your thoughts on it. How did it? How did it, that experience impact on your mental health when that when that happened? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll tell a story. When I was 16, I lost my mum, and um, it it was like um, an out of, like an out of body experience. It's like watching a like watching a scary film go on and I felt like I wasn't me for a while so like like I'd go to counseling I'd go to uh like diff different people go to sit down to some like a uh, vent you know what I mean like you talk about how you feel like like uh I wasn't me for about a couple of months and Cam probably can tell because he's he's stuck by me for 24 years brings me up and all this stuff but I found like as I um I took on hobbies. I've gone do acting on stage for charity. I do all sorts, which makes my aura, aura is it aura, aura yeah. good and warm. Just sort of like build up and make new, new circle of friends. Amazing build up. But yeah, all I can add on is it. It's um, it's like a out of body experience. It's it's scary for a while, but once time goes on, you sort of like heal and you can get positivity and. Thank you for being open and honest. That was so brave of you to say that. And I'm sure that everybody in this room will agree with that you were so brave when you just told your story then. So thank you. What should be done to support young players who have been released from professional football academies? I think that although a player is released from the academy and they're seen as no longer part of the club i think that there needs to be support for six to 12 months following it and um, we see a higher number of players released at ages 16 to 18 and at that age you can see football as a potential career to have your dreams shattered essentially at that age it's really hard to deal with um do you know if everyone's aware um that Jeremy Whiston, um, so he was a Man City Academy player. He took his life after being released. And I just think it's something that we need to make aware and we need to speak about more because it, it can be ruthless in football. Yes, I believe football is the most beautiful game in the world. Um, however, especially when we're looking at academy situations, are they doing enough for their young people when they leave them? And 
I, I don't think they are. I think there has to be some kind of support in there, um, whether that's helping them find another club. Um, because I know I know a lot of people that have been released from academies and that that's it. That's the last I hear from them. There's not even support finding them another club to continue playing football. And for me, that's just that's just not enough for the young people. <laughs>
the Hereford FA Youth Council's Listen In With The Youth Council podcast series. Thank you ever so much to David Harding from Hereford and Mind, Hannah Marshall from the National FA Youth Council and Durham County FA Youth Council and Lee Gell from the National FA Youth Council and um, Essex County FA Youth Council.